Good afternoon, everyone. It is 2 o'clock, so I think we will get started. So I'm Brittany Hernan, the Early Detection Project Manager, and a little bit later we'll hear from Lucy Nestle about management, and she is the Terrestrial Invasive Species Project Manager. And thank you for taking the time to join us today to learn about woody invasive species management. So as most of you know, we are Western New York PRISM, and that is a partnership for regional invasive species management. There are eight of these PRISM regions across New York, and our region encompasses the eight westernmost counties. We want to minimize the harm caused by invasive species to the economy, environment, and human health. And a key to our work is partnership, as our name suggests. We do work with a wide variety of organizations across the region to greatly increase invasive species management efforts. We also focus on information management. We want to ensure that we are providing you with up-to-date invasive species information, give you the best resources and tools that are available, um, education and outreach to continue increasing everyone's knowledge of invasive species, prevention, which I will touch on a bit later in the presentation, early detection and rapid response efforts to remove new species from the region, and invasive species management and habitat restoration. So to start off, I just wanted to go over identification of some woody invasive species in the area, since the starting point of any management effort is correctly identifying the invasive species you have present on your property. The woody species I go over are all ones that can be treated during the fall and winter. The first species I wanted to discuss is invasive bush honeysuckle, which is native to Asia. We do have a native honeysuckle, and an easy way to tell the difference is to cut a branch, and if it is hollow inside, so you can see the cross section like I put on the screen, then it's invasive. And typically, if you have a dense stand of honeysuckle, it's an invasive species. There are multiple species of invasive honeysuckles, and they all have this hollow pith identifying characteristic. This shrub can grow pretty large, up to 15 feet tall. It has leaves that are opposite, and they can be oval or tapered at the tip. In May and June, differentiation of the multiple invasive bush honeysuckle species can be determined using the flowers that are present, and these flowers are red, pink, or white. But for management purposes, as long as you can identify that honeysuckle is invasive on your property, the treatment methods are the same for all species. From July through September, they produce yellow or red berries. These berries are eaten by birds, but they do not provide the same nutrition as native species. The bark on larger stems is shaggy, and for fall and winter identification and management, the hollow pith and shaggy bark will be your best identifying characteristics. In order to see the hollow pith, you will want to cut the branch at a spot that's further away from the base, since this feature is sometimes hard to see right at the base of the shrub. Also, as you can see in the picture, honeysuckle may have multiple stems on one plant that intertwine, which does add a degree of difficulty to management. The species leafs out early in the season and can shade out native plants. This can also encourage birds to nest earlier in the year and lower to the ground where there is a greater predation risk. Another problematic invasive shrub is multiflora rose, which is native to Asia. This shrub has thorns and can grow up to 15 feet tall. It has alternate compound leaves with 5 to 11 leaflets and serrate margins. At the base of the leaves, there are these fringed stipules present, which is this little clump of hairs that you can see on the screen right at the base of the leaves. And this helps distinguish multiflora rose from other roses. In late spring, it has clusters of white flowers that have five petals. Native roses only have one flower at the end of the stem, and this one has a bunch, so this is another way to tell if you have the invasive multiflora rose. The fruit, called rose hips, form later in the season, and they are present throughout the winter. These red rose hips, along with thorns and the fringe stipules, will help with identification for fall and winter management of the species. And I took the one photo on the screen recently, so you can see a few rose hips are present, and also the thorns and the fringe stipules, just so you can get an idea of what the plant would look like in the fall and winter. This is challenging to work with, and you need to be careful handling the plant to avoid getting pricked by too many thorns. The species is problematic because the seeds can remain viable for up to 20 years, so when you see an infestation, you know there is a large seed bank present. And this might sound overwhelming, but it just means that management will require a bit more persistence and dedication. The species can also host a virus, which can spread to native roses as well. Common buckthorn is a shrub or tree native to Eurasia and can grow up to 25 feet tall. An easy way to distinguish this species during any season is by the bark. The outer bark is dark gray, while the inner bark is orange. As you can see on the screen, if you scrape away a little bark, it will reveal this orange color. The outer gray bark has lenticels, which are short, horizontal, light-colored lines. Common buckthorn leaves are hairless and have tiny teeth along their margins. The veins on the leaves curl upwards towards the tip from the midvein, which can also be seen in the photo. 
In the spring, this species has clusters of small, yellow-green, four-petaled flowers. Common buckthorn has purple or black berries, which are still present in the fall and can help with late-season identification. This is another species that produces leaves early in the spring and shades out native species. Common buckthorn forms very dense thickets, which again shade out native species and tree seedlings. And similar to honeysuckle, the berries are eaten by birds but provide poor nutrition. Glossy buckthorn is native to Europe, northern Africa, and western Asia and has many similarities to common buckthorn. The leaves are the easiest way to tell these species apart. The leaves of glossy buckthorn have smooth margins and sometimes fine hairs underneath. For these leaves, the veins run parallel to the midvein, unlike common buckthorn, which we saw before, where the veins are curved upward towards the tip of the leaf. Glossy buckthorn also has that characteristic orange bark present if you scrape the outer bark, like common buckthorn. This species has berries that are red to dark purple, so the ones in this photo have not quite ripened yet. It also negatively impacts native plants and birds by shading out native species and providing berries with poor nutritional quality. It tends to grow in wetter areas compared to common buckthorn. In this photo that we have right here, it's growing near water. Privet species are perennial deciduous shrubs native to China and Japan that may grow up to 20 feet tall. The leaves are opposite with smooth margins and oval to oblong. Some can have thorny twigs coming out from the branches. This species has clusters of small, white, trumpet-like flowers at the tips of the branches, which can be seen in the photo. It produces blackberries that remain throughout the winter, and that's why I chose this nice picture of snow-covered berries to really show how this feature can be used during the fall and winter to identify the species. The foliage can be toxic to mammals in the wild, and the foliage and berries are toxic to humans. The species became popular and spread due to its ability to form hedges and offer privacy for private landowners. It's a nice idea to plant hedges and have some privacy for your neighbor isn't always peering over into your yard and you can't see them. But the plants do not remain on one's property and can then escape into the forests and nearby land. These dense thickets that privet forms shade out native plants and can displace native shrubs and seedlings in forests. Privet hedgerows are actually pretty common right here where we are in the city of Buffalo. Autumn olive is a large shrub native to Asia and can grow up to 15 feet tall. It has dull green leaves with wavy margins and silver undersides. And if you're near the shrub, when the wind blows, the silvery undersides are very apparent and the species has a nice shimmer to it. The shiny shimmer effect can help identify the shrub in the distance as you're walking along trails either to survey or just, you know, enjoying a nice hike in nature. In the early summer, the species produces white trumpet-like flowers. Red berries mature late into the fall and can be seen late in the season, which helps to identify this species. The bark is gray-brown and can have thorns on it. Autumn olive has nitrogen-fixing bacteria in its roots, which allows it to grow in even the least fertile soils and can also disrupt normal nutrient cycling in those areas. One shrub can produce up to 200,000 seeds in a year. The berries are very attractive to birds. There's the picture on the screen. There's these nice vibrant red-colored berries, and the birds then spread these seeds so it can really move around and establish in new areas pretty easily. Japanese barberry is a shrub that has grooved stems with many thorns, and anyone who's come in contact with this plant knows how painful it can really be to work with if you get stuck with those thorns. It has small, smooth leaves that grow in irregular clumps. In April and May, small umbrella-shaped clusters of white flowers can be seen on the shrub. Later in the summer or early fall, small red berries are produced and remain on the shrub into winter. This plant forms very thick, dense infestations, and we do have a previous staff member posing with some Japanese barberry. I wanted to include that so you could get a nice sense of how dense, you know, these infestations really are. Um, one impact is it provides protected habitat for deer mice, which host larval deer ticks. The dense Japanese barberry infestations also help retain humidity and provide a nice habitat for ticks as well. So Japanese barberry is associated with an increase in Lyme disease. The species is very popular in landscaping and can be seen, you know, at your doctor's office, maybe in plazas, things like that. But unfortunately, it can spread into nearby forests and establish large populations. It is another challenging species to handle because of the thorns, but it could be one that you really want to prioritize to manage on your property, especially with the association with ticks and Lyme disease. Oriental bittersweet is a perennial woody vine that is native to Asia. It can grow up to 60 feet tall and wraps around native species of trees and damages them by girdling. This is a nice photo on the screen, which really demonstrates the harmful effects that bittersweet can have on trees. The leaves are elliptical to ovate and spiral around the vine, as you can see in the picture. 
Flowers are present in May and June and form fruits in the fall that remain on the vine late into the season. There is also a native species called American bittersweet that looks very similar to the invasive one. The flowers and fruits of oriental bittersweet can occur anywhere along the vine stem, while American bittersweet only has fruits on the end of the stem, so that is a characteristic that you can use to tell these apart. And before carrying out any management on this vine, just be sure you take those extra steps to ensure you have invasive oriental bittersweet and not the native American bittersweet. Tree of Heaven is another problematic invasive species, and some organizations are encouraging people to go out and identify and report this species, since it is a preferred host of the spotted lanternfly. The spotted lanternfly is an invasive insect that has the potential to negatively impact the environment and agriculture. This insect feeds on important agricultural crops, such as grapes, apples, and hops, so it has some potential negative impacts on vineyards, wineries, things like that. Populations of this species have recently been found in New York, so identifying and reporting the Tree of Heaven so traps can be set is really important right now. Tree of Heaven is native to China and can grow up to 100 feet tall. The species has pinnately compound leaves with 10 to 40 leaflets. The leaflets have a small bump at the base, which I tried to choose a picture where that's kind of obvious on the screen, um, because this is a feature that can be used to distinguish Tree of Heaven from native staghorn sumac trees. Tree of Heaven leaflets have smooth margins, while staghorn sumac leaves are serrate. Also, sumac leaves turn a vibrant red color in the fall, while Tree of Heaven leaves remain green. Tree of Heaven has small clusters of flowers that form seed clusters late in summer. And I took the one photo a couple of weeks ago, um, and the seeds can still be seen on the species, so that's a good way to help with identification. And also, as you can see, the leaves are relatively green, which can stick out against some of the nice fall foliage and also help distinguish Tree of Heaven from the red sumac leaves. The bark is cantaloupe-like with large, very characteristic leaf scars, which can be used year-round to identify this species. And if you remove a branch or leaf, it smells like burnt peanut butter. I actually think this scent is quite nice. Some people do find it a bit repulsive. But in any case, if you go through all of those bark, leaf, flower, seed characteristics and are still unsure about identification, you can just break off a leaf or a branch and this strong smell will really help out. The species can produce allelopathic chemicals that leach into the soil and prevent the establishment of other plants. The species can also tolerate acidic soils and air pollution, further expanding the amount of suitable habitat for Tree of Heaven. Established trees can spread by sending up root suckers, and when stems are cut or broken, the tree aggressively produces sprouts. Japanese angelica tree is a deciduous shrub or tree native to Northeast Asia and can grow up to 40 feet tall. This is considered an early detection species in the Western New York Prism region, which means it is only found in a few locations and the management goal for this species is eradication. The Western New York Prism seasonal crew has been conducting herbicide treatment over the past two years of the one known population in the Western New York Prism region. The bark of Japanese angelica tree is covered in sharp thorns, which are pictured on the slide. The leaves of this species are pinnately compound and it produces cream and white colored flowers that grow in large panicles in late summer. Purple black fruits ripen in the fall, and Japanese angelica tree is another one that sprouts from root suckers to form large dominating thickets. Over time, these thickets displace native vegetation and reduce biodiversity. Black locust is a tree that grows 40 to 100 feet tall. It has alternate compound leaves with 7 to 21 oval shaped leaflets. It also has pairs of thorns at the base. As you can see, some of those nice sized thorns are on that photo, and they're, you know, Another one that would be challenging to work with because of the thorns. Clusters of fragrant white flowers are present early in the year around May to June. It has two to four inch seed pods which mature around September and remain on the tree into winter. This tree is competitive because it can grow in nitrogen deficient soils. Black locust trees also have an extensive root system that allows them to reproduce clonally, sprouting many clones in one area and forming a dense canopy that shades out native species. And so now we're going to turn it over to Lucy, and she's going to tell us about some different ways to manage these species that we just learned about. Okay, <clears throat> thank you so much, Brittany, and thank you everyone for listening in today. It looks like we have quite a group with us, so thank you again. For my section today, I'm going to be going over woody invasive species management. I'm going to discuss different management techniques and applications, then get into the planning for your property after that. Just so people know, we do have best management practice fact sheets available on our, on our website at wnyprism.org. Uh, these fact sheets 
talk about the best management practices for various species, one of which being woody invasive species. So it's going to be a lot of the same info that I go over today, so please check that out. The two categories of management I'm going to discuss are manual and chemical. Regardless of the type of management you pursue, control and eradication of woody invasive species will take several years, followed by a few more years of monitoring for seedlings. Brittany's going to be talking about monitoring a bit more in depth later in the presentation, so I won't go too deep into that now. So if you're only dealing with small and scattered plants, there's a few manual options to consider. If you're dealing with larger or more dense concentrations of woody invasive species, some form of herbicide treatment is most commonly the best management practice. I'm going to discuss and describe each of these and show some video clips as well within the next couple slides. So let's say you're dealing with small, scattered individual plants, similar to the large picture on this slide here. This is honestly the best case scenario, other than not having them at all. So in this situation, it is possible to manually pull these species out by hand, just like weeding your garden. The picture on the right-hand side is a relatively small infestation of Tree of Heaven my crew and I found and manually removed this past field season up in Niagara County. It's great when you can catch these things like this fast before it turns into a bigger and more time-consuming problem. Other forms of manual removal include digging with a shovel and something called a weed wrench, which I'm going to show in action in the next video clip. So I included a couple different video clips in this presentation. So I'm sure that a lot of you are familiar with removing plants with shovels. It's really not that complicated. But the video clips that I'm about to show are meant to show more the amount of effort it takes to dig out one individual plant and the amount of soil disturbance that comes along with it. So soil disturbance is a negative side effect of manual removal because it can lead to erosion, disruption of microbial activities in the soil, and introduction or reintroduction of invasive species. As some of you may know, invasive species thrive in disturbed areas. Um, so you can see the plants in these clips uh, are growing in a field with lots of other grasses and other plants. Um, so there's a lot of roots intertwined, making it a bit more difficult to remove. So then here we are, we have our infamous weed wrench. The way you use it is pretty simple. You place the small tree between the clamps at the bottom, uh, get a good grip, and pull the handle back. Western Year Prism has a few of these, and we honestly don't really use them all that much. They are only effective for such a small range of plant sizes, and they are very bulky and heavy to carry around. Uh, this plant that I'm digging up here is a somewhat larger autumn olive, uh, whereas the plant in the last clip was a smaller buckthorn. Uh, as you can see, I have to eventually use the shovel um, in this area, like I said, because of all the roots and things, making it that much more difficult to dig out. So with this weed wrench for this particular plant, uh, you can see all the soil disturbance that comes out with it. I probably take out about 10 pounds of soil with that single plant here. So those are our manual options. Uh, but when we start to get into more dense or larger plants, the best management practices for woody invasive species typically involve herbicide applications. Pictured on this slide are four different applications, each of which I will dive into and show some more video clips of. These include foliar spraying for small, dense plants, cut stump and basil bark treatment for the next size up, and finally girdling for larger trees. So in New York State, there are strict pesticide laws, but it is legal for private property owners to apply herbicides on their own property, at least the type of pesticides that you can buy at Lowe's and Home Depot, some of which are pictured on this slide. I am a New York State certified pesticide applicator, so I am able to apply commercial grade pesticides to properties that I do not own. It looks like there are a lot of licensed applicators on the call today. So in order to become licensed, if you're not familiar, uh, you do need to pass exams and you need to pay the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation some fees as well. And there's a couple other steps as well, but there are a lot of laws and specifics that revolve around pesticide use in New York State. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to get too deep into that. But if you have any specific questions, please let me know and I will do my best to answer. The biggest thing to remember is that the label is the law in New York State. You have to read and follow the label exactly. 
Herbicide treatment is the best management practice for a lot of our woody invasive species because it is highly effective. It reduces the number of years you have to manage. It is very targeted and it reduces soil disturbance. As far as which herbicide to use, uh, for all the following applications I'm going to talk about, I suggest finding a product with the active ingredient triclopyr. Uh, this ingredient is systemic, meaning it translocates into the root system. It is a common ingredient found in products at Home Depot that target woody species. Uh, the one pictured on this slide, I believe, is called brush killer. So in these pictures here, we have dense concentrations of small plants. If you tried to manually remove all of these, it would create an immense amount of soil disturbance, which will most likely, as I mentioned before, lead to other invasive species moving into its place. Also, depending on your available time and funds or resources, manual removal of an area like this can take a lot more time than you may anticipate. Uh, the best management practice for this species here, which is common buckthorn, uh, would be foliar spraying with a triclopyr product. Uh, although you could use a glyphosate product for less hardy species such as multiflora rose or honeysuckle. So I would say go out and get yourself a backpack or a hand pump from your local hardware store or somewhere online. I do want to mention that I know this webinar is geared towards fall and winter management. So I need to mention that I only suggest foliar spraying in the spring, summer, and early fall. It's not really an option in the winter. To foliar spray, you want the plant to still have its leaves and they shouldn't be yellow and falling off. For this type of application, the herbicide soaks in through the leaves. So maybe you're thinking, can I just cut or mow these woody invasive species without having to use herbicides? But sadly, the answer is no. Woody species respond to physical injury by re-sprouting, making continued management increasingly difficult as stems become denser and more intertwined. So maybe when you had one single stem plant before, now you have a multi-stem mess that's going to take a bit longer to manage. So in this video clip, we show a nature preserve in western New York where mowing and cutting was the only management employed for a year or two, and you can see how dense the common buckthorn is now. So the best management practice for this situation would be foliar spraying, which we're showing here. The biggest thing is you want to make sure you get close to 100% or as close to 100% leaf coverage as possible. The herbicide is going to be taken up by the plant that much better. And once again, uh, this should really only be done in the spring and summer or early fall. So the next size up, the next step up in size class is medium to large shrubs and trees. This could be anything from a multi-stemmed bush up to a 10-foot or more tree. In this case, maybe due to the size of the tree, but also maybe due to the time of the year, foliar spraying is not an option, and you have to consider alternatives such as basil bark treatment, cut stump treatment, or girdling. All of these treatments involve the cambium layer of the tree, which is shown in the diagram here. This layer, found right beneath the bark, is a part of the tree that is actively growing and that needs to be addressed with herbicide to make each of those applications I mentioned effective. If the cambium is targeted, it interrupts the movements of nutrients and eventually kills the tree. So if you are new to managing large woody invasive species, you may want to start by measuring some shrubs and trees you plan to target. For certain applications, there are size limits to the trees you're supposed to treat. So in this first clip here, I am measuring DBH, or diameter at breast height, which is typically how sizes are listed on herbicide labels. So in order to get DBH, I am measuring the circumference of the tree at breast height. And then you have to do a little bit of math. Uh, so this one is 10 inches. And after you do a little bit of math, it comes out to 3.18 diameter. The second one is about 8 inches in circumference, or 2.5 diameter. So, uh, this application here is called basil bark. It is meant for trees that have 6 inches or less dbh. So we're right in that range here, as you can see. For basil bark treatment, you want to make a complete ring around the stem, down close to the root collar, making sure to connect on each side. You want to wet the tree, but not to the point of runoff. Uh, the herbicide seeps into the cambium layer and kills a tree over time without the need to cut into it. 
I want to mention that we can also use basal bark treatment for species that aggressively re-sprout when cut, uh, including tree of heaven, black locust. So then a cut stump is the next one up. Um, you could use loppers, hand saws, chainsaws, brush cutters, whatever you have available, but also whatever makes the most sense for the size of the tree that you're dealing with. In the clip here that's coming up, uh, we are cutting a tree that's about 10 inches in circumference, three inches DBH uh, with a handsaw. So a few things, you wanna make sure that you cut the tree nice and level and that it's down close to the ground. The higher that you cut, it's more likely that you're going to have re-sprouts. And then once you cut, you wanna make sure that you clean away any debris so then as far as herbicide application goes, you wet that cambium layer, which is right on the other side of the bark. Once again, you don't want to do this to the point of runoff, uh, but sometimes a bit, it's a bit hard to get no runoff on these small stumps. Uh, here's a multi-stemmed honeysuckle that we cut. As you can see, we're just treating the cambium layer. You want to get complete coverage uh, to minimize the possibility of re-sprouts. Then next up is girdling. Uh, some people may refer to similar applications as frill cuts or hack and squirt. Uh, this can be used on larger trees that you don't feel comfortable taking down or you don't have the capacity to take down. So I will mention that although for this kind of application, it might create some habitat for wildlife, it is going to be leaving a hazard. It's going to be leaving a large dead tree, which can be a hazard if it's going to be next to a trail, a hiking trail, or say someone's house. So that's something to consider as well. You want to make sure you cut around the entire circumference of the tree. You want to cut through the bark, at least through the cambium layer, but you can cut into the sapwood a little bit too. You don't need to go too, too deep. Then you get rid of any debris. I do want to mention too that since we are talking about treatment in the fall and winter, woody plants treated late in the growing season are susceptible but may not show injury symptoms until the following spring when leaves and stems fail to emerge. In the winter months, the herbicide is going to move slower through the plant and you may see some re-sprouts. But on the other hand, it is also a good time to work in more sensitive areas, such as wetlands, because there won't be as much disturbance to the ground, because usually in the winter months, the ground is somewhat frozen. Then it's time for the herbicide application. Uh, similar to basil bark, you're treating all the way around the tree. You want to make sure that the herbicide connects on each side. So in this next section here, I'm going to be talking about planning management on your property. The first step for any invasive species management, be it woody species or otherwise, is to complete a thorough survey of the property. It's hard to plan and prioritize when you do not know exactly what is out there. Also, I'm talking about surveying or managing your own property, or maybe a property that you're contracted to work on. Uh, please do not go onto private property unless you have the permission from that private property landowner. In order to survey your property, there's a couple different things that you can do. Uh, you can go out and find and mark the woody invasive species present with tape or flagging. You can do this at any time of year. It is easiest to do when the leaves are present in the spring, summer, or fall, but it's possible to do in the winter as well if you are confident with your dormant species ID. Another option is to use free apps, some of which I've listed here, uh, with GPS mapping capabilities. I listed Gaia GPS and Locust Map. I'm sure there are many, many others out there, but these are just two that I've personally used. So with these apps, you can go out in the field and collect data points with as much or as little detail as you want. This way you can go back and look at an aerial view of the site and see just what you're dealing with. So once you have surveyed your property and you know what you're up against, my advice is to take a deep breath and try not to get overwhelmed. Woody invasive species are very common in Western New York, so it's pretty likely that you have some on your property. But now that you've found these species, that's not to say that you have to go out and eradicate them immediately. Part of the planning process is knowing how much time you can spend on these management projects, um, and maybe do you know anybody that's willing to come out and help you? These are small factors to consider when you want to plan for management on your property, as well as the next couple points that I'm going to bring up. 
So do you have or do you have the capacity to purchase or borrow the right tools for the job? Uh, whenever we talk about invasive species management, we speak in terms of best management practices. If you don't have the right tools for the job, my recommendation is to wait until you do. Managing invasive species incorrectly can oftentimes make the situation worse and that much harder to manage down the line. As I've mentioned a couple times now, when you cut most woody invasive species without the use of herbicides, they produce re-sprouts. Also, not all invasive species are created equal. Some species are considered early detection, which Brittany brought up a little bit earlier today. One woody invasive species on our early detection list currently is Japanese angelica tree. So I would say look for those species first. There's also some species out there that are, that are a bit less common than your typical honeysuckle, buckthorn, um, species such as oriental bittersweet or tree of heaven. If you find these less common species on your property, I would say please target these first before they have a chance to establish and spread. So let's say you have all the tools that you need, or you don't have any early detection species, then you want to look at those species that you only have small individual plants of. You want to concentrate on species you have low densities rather than starting in an area uh, with uh, 10 acres of honeysuckle. You might as well concentrate on those few individual species first. So then lastly, I just wanted to mention that you should consider access to the site as well. And I thought that I would discuss this with some real life examples. So for example, one, this is a map showing, um, I actually recently just bought a home in Western New York and it came with one and a half acres of wooded area, which is great, but sadly about half of that is common and glossy buckthorn. So the wooded area is very dense. It's hard to stand up in, in certain areas, let alone get large equipment like chainsaws or brush cutters back there. So in this situation, I pretty much have to start from the edge and chip away at it as I go. That or blaze a trail through the middle and work out from there. Either way, access is the main factor I have to consider when planning my invasive species management. So then example two is a map of a nature preserve in the Western York area. So let's say you're working on invasive species at a nature preserve or a park that already has established trails. Because of this, you can access a lot more of your property than my previous example. The letter P on the map represents the parking area and the yellow line is the trail system. Both of which, as you can see, is where the densest invasive species cover is present within the park. This is really no surprise because seeds commonly spread along hiking trails, um, but the good news is that most of the property has very low invasive species cover. I would say start in those areas and work your way into the denser areas. This way you can manage over three quarters of the preserve in the course of maybe a couple days, uh, rather than getting bogged down in a very dense one acre area. Obviously, the goal is to eventually manage everything on the property, but you have to prioritize management areas as you go. You can't do everything at once. We are human after all. So these are just some examples of what a property could look like. Obviously, there's going to be lots of different scenarios with varying species, concentrations, routes of entry. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Brittany for the last sections on prevention and monitoring. Thank you, Lucy. So after hearing about all of these different harmful invasive species and treatment methods and the work that it really takes to get infestations under control, it should stress that prevention is really important. We need to take the steps to make sure these infestations do not happen in the first place. One important and relatively easy change people can make is to plant native species. Whether this means planting native species in gardens or using them for landscaping, this is a great way to prevent invasive species introductions. Invasive species can escape from yards and establish in neighboring properties, forests, pristine areas, and cause harm there by creating those large infestations that we talked about. We do have resources about native alternatives to invasive species, so if anyone is interested in those, they can check out our website or always send us an email about any of these things that we talk about during the webinar, and we would love to help you out. When buying plants, just take a little bit of time to do some research first to see what species are native to your area and also what would be beneficial in the landscape you are planting them in. This might involve finding native plant nurseries or maybe ones that have native plant selections. You could look on Facebook, different forms of social media. I know this is becoming very popular now, so 
Hopefully you're able to find some nurseries in your area that sell native plants. You can even look out for groups of people that have native seed they are willing to swap. Also, when looking into landscaping options, it is important to make sure native flowers and shrubs are being used. Besides being a prevention measure, native plants provide great benefits to the local ecosystem as well. Another prevention method is regularly conducting species inventories of your property or the park that you manage. These surveys involve walking along trails, parking lots, playgrounds, picnic areas, anywhere that people really use to get an idea of what species are found. Depending on your goals, the surveys can be invasive species specific or they can involve looking at all the species that you have present on the property. By trying to identify a wide range of species, you may even catch some invasive species that are present that you didn't realize were invasive. At some locations that we've worked at over the years, um, or places we have found large infestations of invasive species, the plants were around for so long and the infestations grew very large that people just kind of assumed those plants were native and were supposed to be growing in the area. So these species inventories will allow you to get a picture of what species are present and also catch new invasives that begin to grow in the area. If you can catch invasive species early when there are a couple of plants instead of a dense infestation, management is much easier, as you heard. This process can be as easy as educating volunteers on certain invasive species and assigning them small sections of the park to survey. If you are able to dedicate money to have staff members or interns that focus on surveys, it can really help catching new invasive species. Um, this may not be as high a priority for private landowners on your own personal land, but it could be a fun learning opportunity for yourself or your family. You know, grab some ID guides or some ID apps and just get outside and take a look around and learn what species you have on your property. As you can see in these pictures, it really is a great way to get people outside, learn about species identification, practice using field guides, things like that. And even if only certain sections are surveyed every year on a rotating basis, this can still help prevent infestations. Western New York PRISM does have some survey resources, including a protocol with suggested materials and data sheets available on our website to assist with this process. And if you need more information or advice on technology, survey techniques, things like that, you can always reach out to us. Surveys are a large part of invasive species management and the work that we do every year. And we always take time to look at our protocol, look at the different tablets, technology, things like that that we're using, the different programs, and really keep updating our survey protocols so that they're up to date and talk about the best tactics. Spread prevention is important so you don't accidentally bring invasive species to a new area. While we are all interested in controlling invasive species, it is important to ensure we do not spread these species in the process of our control efforts. One tool to keep on hand is a small boot brush to clean off footwear. While most woody species we discussed produce berries that are less likely to spread in the treads of your boots, you might unknowingly walk through populations of other invasive grasses or forbs while carrying out woody invasive species management. So it's not always a good idea to have a brush with you to clean off your shoes and your clothing. Also, if you have a hood or pockets where berries could get caught, it might be helpful to check for those as well. You can install boot brush stations so people can clean mud off footwear that could potentially spread invasive species seeds. These boot brush stations are also a great educational tool. As you can see in the picture, they have a nice sign on them that describes why it's important to clean off shoes and clothing in the first place, talks about invasive species, and even highlights a few species in that area to be on the lookout for. We do have a recorded webinar on our website that describes the materials you need to purchase for the boot brush stations and also the installation process. Boot brush stations can help prevent recreational trail users from spreading invasive species into a section of park that you have been treating over time. So whether it's invasive species management or just a leisurely hike, it really is recommended to clean off footwear before entering an area and before leaving. Besides your own personal clothing, it is important to make an effort to clean off pets after walks as well. While you probably are not bringing your pet along for invasive species management, though maybe your dog likes to come out there while you're, you know, digging up a couple of plants. They like to get outside, help you out. But practicing this behavior and encouraging others to do so can help prevent invasive species from spreading to new areas. Another good practice is cleaning out mud that is caked in tires of cars, trucks, ATVs, other vehicles that you might be using out in the field. We have a few sites we work at that have heavy, off-trail ATV use, which is not permitted, and if somebody rides through an area while species are producing seeds and then loads the ATV onto a trailer and brings it to a new site, once they go to the next site, seed can easily be spread from the tires. Um, clean off all equipment after treatment as well. Plants and seeds can get caught in mowers and spread to new areas that way. 
and if you work with highway departments, it can also be helpful to meet with them and talk about the importance of cleaning equipment in between sites. Also, if you are overseeing a larger scale project, you can have cleaning as an item in contracts, so logging equipment or construction equipment must be clean when moving between sites. And so as you implement invasive species management, it is important to collect metrics to look at treatment success over time. So Lucy discussed many management options, and we also have best management practices documents on our website to guide your efforts. But in the end, each site is unique, and efforts need to be tracked over time. Collecting data is helpful to determine if adjustments in your methods need to be made to continue to carry out management successfully. Data can even show when you switch twits from one treatment to another, like from herbicide treatment of a dense infestation to manual removal of a few sparse plants. A good starting point would be to determine the area of the infestation and also the area you are able to treat each year. In a perfect world, you would be able to go out, treat an entire infestation every single year, but we know with limited resources, this is not always the case. You can look at infestation and treatment areas over time to ensure you are working towards treating the entire infestation. This is also helpful to see if infested area increases over time, which could mean a different treatment method or additional spread prevention efforts are necessary for your management. There are a few easy ways to determine area. If you have a GPS unit, you can collect a polygon or track by walking around the entire infestation. There are also data collection apps such as Collector, which we used this summer, which make it easy to determine infested area. You can even walk along the perimeter of an infestation and take a few points with your cell phone and then look at that on the map. Area is a nice visual over time, and it's also a helpful metric to have for grants if you need to apply for funding to continue your efforts. But whatever area method you choose, it is really helpful to use flagging and map out the infestation first. Otherwise, you might be doubling back as more plants are found and kind of have jagged edges and things like that because it really is hard to look at an infestation when you're right in the middle of the dense area. And so I just included a little map. This might be something that you use for reporting purposes just to look at the you know, total infested areas in a location. Another metric you can look at is density. And this is simply determining the number of stems of woody species in a given area before treatment and then continuing to track this method over time. One thing to remember is that removing large shrubs can open up space for new ones to grow in, since most species that are established have an extensive seed bank. It might be more informative then to count the number of mature plants, saplings, and seedlings to get a better idea of the population over time in response to treatment. It can be expected that you'll have many more seedlings over time as the seed bank is depleted, but you want to make sure that every year you don't have all of these mature plants, which might mean you were missing some during treatment. You can also look at percent cover of an area and monitor that over time. This can be a bit difficult since in some cases you are taller than the plant, so you would be looking down to estimate ground cover, but then there are also trees that are taller than you where you would be estimating canopy cover and looking up. There is a tool called the densiometer, which has a little mirror on it and a grid to help accurately estimate overstory cover. An easy way to look at density or percent cover is to establish plots within the treatment area and then collect data in that same spot over time. The size of these sampling plots is up to you, but should be able to cover a representative section of the entire infestation. I've seen a suggestion that for shrubs, 10 meter squared plots be used, and then for trees, 100 meter squared plots be used. So this plot establishment will involve people taking transect tapes, going out there, and as you can see in this photo, you're mapping out these plots first and then collecting data just within that area. And the smaller plot also shows a yellow metal tag, which is used to mark the plot so we can go back every year and find it, but there are also larger stakes and other markers that exist as well for this. As we mentioned, invasive species treatment is a long-term process, so this will have to be carried out over a few years. Even after a species seems under control in an area, it is essential to continue to survey and monitor the area for that species. Once you have a hand on the population, this might involve going out once or twice a season to carefully examine the ground for seedlings and remove them immediately. This should also continue even if you do not find any seedlings in a year. Since the species do have extensive seed banks and you don't want to miss a couple of seedlings and then have all of your work be, you know, kind of to go backwards if those plants are missed because then they can easily reinfest the new area. And so we do have these early detection monitoring sites that we go back to every single year. And in some cases, there are sites where plants are not found for a couple of years and then new ones pop up. And since we continue this monitoring every year, we can remove them 
immediately so the population doesn't come back. So that's why it's really important to go out and keep checking your area for new seedlings. And as you can see in the photos, this really does involve combing the area really closely for seedlings. And I also just wanted to mention that the photos of people close together without masks are from previous years, which is why we have a mix of masked and unmasked staff members as models for this presentation. And so with that, I just wanted to mention that we have one more webinar next Thursday at the same time, um, 2 p.m., on emerging aquatic threats in western New York. And also, most of the webinars from this series have been recorded and are, are available to watch on our website and our YouTube channel. And so with that, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat or unmute your lines to ask them. And thank you for tuning in today. So uh, I saw that there was a couple questions in the chat box already, so we'll go through those pretty quick. What is the most effective treatment on common buckthorn? So it kind of depends on the size we're talking about, but for smaller plants, we have used foliar spraying of, like I said, a triclopyr product. That's been our most effective. Trying to use a glyphosate product doesn't really work all that well on buckthorn, be it glossy and common. Um, and then otherwise, if you're doing cut stump treatment, I once again would recommend something that has triclopyr in the, as the active ingredient. It just is that much more effective on the common buckthorn species. Terry, up next, why aren't all of these species prohibited in New York State, such as privet? That's a good question. Obviously, we would love for all of these invasive species to be pre prohibited or regulated, uh, but they do have to go through a regulatory assessment process. And I believe that the current list that we have from the DEC made the regulatory list back in 2014, um, and these lists were developed using a species assessment tool. The lists that are currently available are being looked at and might be changed within the next year or two. And then, so Donald said basically a comment about the weed wrenches and soil disturbance. Uh, using a shovel causes less disturbance but severs the roots and some species may re-sprout from the roots left behind, uh, which definitely that is correct. We've seen that. The weed wrench may, I, I have used several iterations of that tool, they are not equal. The weed wrench may cause more disturbance, but may remove more of the roots. Coming up next, said, I've been taught that herbicides are not effective in the spring and become more and more effective as the summer moves into the late fall. Related to the direction of sap flow, is this correct? And so I did mention during my section that since we this webinar was more geared towards fall and winter treatment, the fact that you can definitely do cut stump treatment and other Treatments like that in the winter, it just may, you might see some re-sprouts in the spring just because the herbicide is going to be moving that much uh, more slowly through the plants. So as far as when we're talking about spring and summer and fall, it all depends on also the application that you're using. As far as foliar spraying, I would say the most effective time is summer and early fall because the leaves are completely out. If you use herbicide on them, there's more coverage and you're, it's going to be more effective that way. Um, as far as cut stump and other, those kind of applications, sap flow is definitely something to consider. But pretty much cut stump treatment, basal bark treatment, and girdling, they, they can be effective at any time of year. What is the name of the app to record this data? Uh, yes, yeah, so it might be for the, um, maybe the collector app. So we did use an app this summer. This is our first time using it, and it's called, it is Collector, so it's like a GIS-based app. And so it's ArcGIS Collector. And so pretty much what we did is you get the app, and then um, what we did is we worked with IMAP Invasive, and they have a tool called IMAP, it's advanced, and so on there, you can you have to set up an account with IMAP Invasives or get invited to use this. And so I would say that if you go onto the IMAP Invasives website, I know they have a lot of recorded webinars about using this, but it does require an ArcGIS Online account usually to use it as well. And then you can work with IMAP to get an IMAP Mobile Advanced Access. And then once you have that, um, you can record these polygons and collect different data on your phone. And then you can also upload it right to IMAP afterwards. All right, uh, thank you everyone for sticking around and thank you for attending. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to email Lucy or myself.